So uh, today's outline, um, we're basically going to go over a chronology of breast cancer therapy briefly, staging briefly, and then I want to spend more time on recent updates uh, with Oncotype DX, um, ex endocrine therapy, extended endocrine therapy, escalated endocrine therapy, and then future directions in uh, hormone receptor positive early breast cancer. I was asked to focus on non-metastatic diseases. There are other sessions for MBC, so, um, you know, but, you know, some of it does cross-apply, but we'll be mainly focusing on earlier stage disease. So, uh, real briefly, as many of you know, the, the pathway to diagnosis and treatment, either the patient uh, or a significant other or your physician may feel a breast mass, or you may be diagnosed after uh, abnormal imaging or screening mammography or other types of imaging. Uh, eventually, you'll go through a biopsy or aspiration, uh, followed by potentially neoadjuvant therapies, uh, plus or minus, followed by uh, the surgical therapy, uh, which in most cases is lumpectomy or mastectomy, and then management of the axilla, depending on the clinical circumstance. Um, after that, you get your pathologic stage, and uh, subsequently, we uh, would decide on what are the best adjuvant uh, therapies, uh, including chemotherapy, radiation, endocrine therapies, in that order. And subsequently, uh, patients will be on surveillance. Um, so when uh, we get a biopsy, we'll look at, is it invasive disease or is it non-invasive like DCIS? What's the histologic subtype? Most patients, uh, as you know, will have ductal histology, 85%. Um, the grade can vary from one to three or um, uh, basically, the higher the grade, the more aggressive looking it is under the microscope for the pathologist. Uh, the size, we uh, would determine based on the final surgical pathology. Margins, of course, meaning how much normal tissue is there around the, the sample that was excised. Uh, the lymph node status uh, and the status of the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and the HER2 new. Real briefly, staging consists of the size of the tumor, which is the T size, uh, the T part of the TNM staging. Um, and we don't have to memorize this, there won't be a quiz later, but um, obviously T1 is smaller and T4 is more advanced locally, um, extending to sub uh, surrounding tissues. Uh, nodal status, N0 basically means you have no involved lymph nodes and uh, N1 is uh, usually between one to three lymph nodes. Um, now, there is a difference between clinical staging, which is preoperative, and pathologic staging, which is postoperative. Sometimes those are concordant and sometimes they aren't. And some patients will have had chemotherapy in between their initial clinical staging and their final surgery, so those will be understandably discordant. Um, so based on whether you have a small tumor, node involvement, and distant metastatic disease, you'll get a, a stage. And uh, today we'll be focusing on stages one through three. Um, I haven't uh, discussed the surgery much uh, in this talk because there's so much to go over in adjuvant therapy. So uh, going back to the ancient days, um, I hate to say it, but I was a fellow and we were still doing this, but um, adjuvant online, <laughs> Uh, was one of our best tools to estimate what uh, is the likelihood you would benefit from chemotherapy. Um, and back then, it was considered fairly cutting edge. It was based on your age, what other comorbidities you have, uh, what's your estrogen receptor status, of course, the tumor grade, the size, nodal status. Um, and then it would give you a score, basically, and uh, tell you, you know, what's the What's the advantages of uh, doing hormonal therapy, chemotherapy, and combined therapy? So this has all essentially been replaced by the Oncotype DX, which is your 21 gene recurrence score. Many of you may have had this done on your tumor sample. Uh, what they're looking at is basically 16 cancer genes and five background genes uh, from various studies, and they basically give you a score, and uh, looking at the actual nucleic acids of the tumor. They'll determine a gene signature based on what the tumor, uh, how they think it will behave. Uh, and they went through this very extensive process to determine the optimal genes, and these are the 21. Out of 40,000, they picked these 21, so they're very important special genes. 
Um, and uh, this is what a modern Oncotype DX uh, report may look like for a patient um, who is, um, you know, node negative, for example. It would give you a score anywhere from zero to 100. And, um, you know, obviously the lower the recurrence score, um, the, the more likely you are to avoid or have lower benefit of chemotherapy. And if you have a very high recurrence score, then you're likely to benefit from chemotherapy. Now, this test is only eligible to be run on tumors that are estrogen receptor positive and HER2 negative, because those are the patients that we may potentially avoid chemotherapy in. So we know that we don't want to add extra toxicity for people that don't need it. So we always want to tailor our treatment to your tumor, to you. So um, we want to determine, based on this test, what is your likelihood of uh, actually benefiting from adding chemotherapy. Now, everyone on this, um, of course, will be on endocrine therapy. So this is not a way to avoid endocrine therapy. If you look here, it looks estimates your risk of distant recurrence at nine, nine years with aromatase inhibitor or tamoxifen alone. And we'll go over those agents in a minute. And then it'll give you, is there an absolute chemotherapy benefit? And uh, the new reports are nice because they actually will tell you no apparent benefit or exactly what the percentage of benefit is in your specific tumor. And uh, the trials that they actually uh, reviewed those in are also listed here. So one of the newer updates um, in Oncotype DX uh, comes from the Taylor X study. We were waiting for these results for quite some time. This was a prospective trial uh, with uh, over 10,000 women with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, and axillary node negative breast cancer. 69% um, had a mid-range recurrence score. And for many years, this was kind of our... Um, is everything okay? Uh, for, for many years, this was uh, very confusing for, for medical oncologists because we weren't sure what to do with these intermediate scores. So we used to get a score from 0 to 18 would be low, 19 to uh, 31 would be intermediate, and anything above that would be high. So we knew we could avoid chemotherapy in the lows. We knew we had to do chemotherapy, and that would be of benefit in the high scores, but we were never quite sure what to do with the intermediates, and we would really rely on other things like age of the patient, and maybe a lot of it was obviously our gut feeling, like how do you think this patient is going to do either with or without chemotherapy, and base, based on that, decide whether to do adjuvant chemotherapy or not. Um, so Taylor X is basically looking at uh, these intermediate patients, kind of um, from 11 to 25 range, and they randomized them to uh, chemo plus endocrine therapy or just endocrine therapy alone. And basically, it was designed to show um, that there was not inferior outcomes to endocrine therapy alone for disease-free survival. Um, and uh, they basically concluded that adjuvant endocrine therapy and chemoendocrine therapy had similar efficacy in women uh, who had a mid-range uh, 21 gene recurrence score. The caveat is that women under 50 had a very modest benefit, about 1.6% in the Taylor X. So the NCC guidelines uh, currently as they stand, basically if you have a, a node negative, you can have up to a T3 tumor, up to five centimeters, but uh, node negative. Um, if it's above 0.5 centimeters, pretty much everyone will end up getting a 21 gene signature, uh, the Oncotype DX test. Now, occasionally we may decide we don't need it. It's a young patient, a very aggressive looking tumor with other features that would portend a poor prognosis. And in that case, we may decide, you know, there's no point, I'm not, there's no way I wouldn't want to do chemotherapy, so occasionally you won't. But in general, any tumors above 0.5 uh, that are ER positive, uh, hormone receptor positive, and HER2 negative, we would consider the, the, the Oncotype DX. And so um, if you have a recurrence score under 26, uh, you proceed to endocrine therapy. Uh, in between here, of course, if they need radiation, they would get that prior to endocrine therapy. If your recurrence score is 26 to 30, that's kind of, um, you know, the range where you may have a modest benefit. So 
you could do chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy. And then if your recurrence score is above 31, now, now it's basically above you know, 25, um, you would get adjuvant chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy. Um, so can this be extrapolated to node positive disease? So there's, a, there's some previous studies showing that that might be applicable, uh, including the Clalit study, there's a West German study, and uh, the uh, SEER data that showed that you prob you know, there is possible ways to avoid chemotherapy in even node positive patients up to three positive nodes if their Oncotype DX score is on the low end. Now, this is a larger study through SWOG, S1007, and they're looking, uh, it's, I, I believe, close to accrual, but it's not, it hasn't reported any data. They're probably going to report out in 2022. Um, basically, they stratified uh, patients by recurrence score 0 to 13 or 14 to 25, menopausal status, axillary surgery. Um, they did inform the patients of their recurrence score, um, and then... Um, basically, they're looking, on, uh, looking to find is there a significant interaction of treatment uh, assignment and the continuous recurrence score value, and is there a different cut point we should be using to guide future treatment decisions? Um, and then there's some tissue banking as well, so uh, for uh, later analysis, but there's no, I don't think there's a pre-planned tissue analysis. So the NCCN guidelines for node positive disease that are uh, hormone receptor positive um, and HER2 negative have uh, also been updated. Um, now, if their patient's not a candidate for chemotherapy, then you would obviously proceed straight to adjuvant endocrine therapy. Um, if they are a candidate for chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy, then you would consider this assay, talk to the patient. Of course, they would be higher risk than their node negative counterparts. But, um, you know, that is something that you may be able to omit um, because of, of these newer studies. Of course, if the multi-gene assay is not available, the standard answer for node positive disease is to go ahead and offer chemotherapy, followed by endocrine therapy. And, of course, if they have four or more positive nodes, then um, standard of care would be to do chemotherapy. So what's the rationale of endocrine therapy? Um, basically, estrogen, we know, promotes the growth or recurrence of breast cancer by binding to and activating the estrogen receptor in these tumors. So um, it's, it's uh, good and bad. It's good for us in that we can target and disrupt this process. Of course, the bad thing is that, of course, all women will have, uh, and men to some extent, will have estrogen floating around um, to a high extent in their bodies. So what are the ways that you can target this estrogen pathway? The first is to interfere with the receptor binding. Uh, two, you can downregulate the actual estrogen receptor. Um, three, you can uh, decrease the amount of estrogen that is available systemically. So there's different ways you can do that. So tamoxifen is the uh, very first molecule that was used in pre- and post-menopausal women. How it works is it's a... Uh, uh, also called a SERM selective estrogen receptor modulator. In the breast tissue, it's uh, an antagonist of estrogen. In other tissues, such as bone and uh, uterus, it, it can be an agonist. So that's why we call it a SERM and not necessarily a receptor blocker because really it's only in certain tissues that it's blocking the estrogen. So in the breast, though, it is a, uh, binds estrogen and uh, the receptor and, and blocks the activity of estrogen. Uh, how do you downregulate the actual estrogen receptor? Um, the agent that's currently available is called fulvestrant. Right now, it's approved in the metastatic setting only. They did look at uh, some adjuvant studies with fulvestrant, which is an injection, intramuscular. Um, you may have uh, seen it used in the metastatic setting in addition to certain other therapies. Um, they looked at it in the study called GICAM. Um, however, this was closed early because the, they looked at a, another study called the FACT study and found that there was no benefit in the relapse setting to use um, low-dose fulvestrant. However, the criticism of it is that why would you use low-dose fulvestrin? You should use standard dose, which is the 500. So um, right now, the studies aren't quite conclusive, and that may be studied again in the future. 
And so the third way is to decrease available estrogen, and uh, ways that we currently have to do that uh, are use of aromatase inhibitors and um, ovarian suppression, either with or without aromatase inhibitors. So let's start with tamoxifen. Um, I mentioned earlier it's a serum. Um, in breast cells, it's an inhibitor, and it can be given to pre- and postmenopausal women. Um, side effects, uh, many of you may be familiar with. Um, of course, hot flashes are very common, um, and there are some, some ways that we can combat that as well, either with medications or non-pharmacologic ways. Um, some patients do report uh, depression from being on it, and when we switch them to an alternative agent, their depression uh, does improve. There is an increased risk of uterine cancers and uh, thrombotic events like blood clots, um, and um, uh, those can those are very it's a relatively low risk, but we always do um, give patients information regarding that. And if they are at high risk for uh, for um, um, blood clots and for other reasons, then we may opt to not put them on tamoxifen and choose an alternative agent. For example, I had a patient who had had a prior pulmonary embolism. And uh, I don't think she ended up having a genetic predisposition to uh, her blood clot, but because of the, the high-risk blood clot that she had in the past, we opted to instead do ovarian ablation followed by uh, aromatase inhibitor. Come on down. <laughs> um, so uh, you really um, should be able to target the therapy to, uh, to you, so it's, it's uh, better outcomes for, for, for you. It's an oral agent taken by mouth, five to 10 years, and we'll go over some of the data with extended therapy. Um, and like I mentioned before, it is protective in the bone. So um, if you have a patient with osteoporosis, uh, and you may not want to put them on aromatase inhibitor because those can worsen bone density, um, you may opt to use tamoxifen instead because it does help build up your bone density. Um, so what are the studies with tamoxifen? The earlier studies we find I'm just going to go over these real briefly because I want to spend more time on the extended therapies that are the most recent updates. So we know that it decreases annual odds of recurrence by 39% and annual odds of death by 31%, and that's uh, irrespective of the use of chemotherapy, uh, your age, your menopausal status, and your axillary lymph node status. Uh, one of the big studies um, with tamoxifen was NSABP B14. Uh, which was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in node-negative hormone receptor-positive patients, and they found uh, a significant disease-free survival, DFS, and overall survival regardless of age. Um, and in uh, the other breast, the contralateral breast, um, in tamoxifen-treated patients, they had 3.7% uh, development of breast cancer versus 6.1% on placebo. So um, these are... Uh, uh, the questions that we ask, is five years kind of arbitrary? Probably. So is there a benefit to extending it even further? Um, so we know that for, uh, tamoxifen for five years is better than tamoxifen for one to two years based on our prior studies. So obviously more is better, right? Not always, but uh, we looked at whether five years versus 10 years would show a difference. Um, so we, we did find that there was decreased relapse by 3.7%, so 25.1% in the, the five-year arm, and 21.4% in the 10-year arm, and breast cancer-related mortality in the 10-year arm. As uh, predicted, there was, was a higher, slightly higher risk of uterine cancer, 3.1 versus 1.6%, and pulmonary embolism in the 10-year arm. And there were subsequent studies uh, done, including ADAM, which also confirmed this. Um, now, does that mean everyone needs 10 years? Um, the data is not quite clear. They're still looking at different ways to decide uh, whether we should be doing, um, you know, for younger patients, we do tend to uh, extend therapy if they have higher risk tumors based on, you know, stage, grade, all that, all that stuff. But, um, you know, there's no clear-cut answer as to who should get 5 or 10 or or maybe longer therapy. But if you're tolerating it well, I have offered it to, to patients to extend it um, as long as they're tolerating it and they don't have additional risk factors for thrombosis or blood clots. Um, so, um, you know, that is an option for young patients. 
Um, endocrine therapy, uh, the last, uh, you can also decrease available estrogen with the use of aromatase inhibitors and ovarian suppression. So what aromatase inhibitors do, um, they basically block the enzyme aromatase. And what aromatase does is it uh, converts androgens like testosterone to estrogen in the peripheral tissues such as fat or muscle. So by blocking that, you basically reduce the amount of available estrogen that's floating around. Now, this can only be used in postmenopausal women because in premenopausal women, the majority of your estrogen is going to be from the ovaries, right? So um, blocking peripheral conversion is not really going to help you much. In fact, it may actually ramp up your ovarian uh, estrogen production to kind of compensate for that. So, um, you know, we uh, uh, wouldn't offer in somebody that's premenopausal unless they've had ovarian ablation of, or ovarian suppression, which we'll go over in a second. Um, there's a couple of different versions of uh, uh, veromatase inhibitors. There's non-steroidal, uh, and astrozole and letrozole are the most common. Um, and then there's a steroidal called exemestane or aromacin, uh, which we are using with uh, ovarian suppression in younger women. Um, in postmenopausal women, the studies do show benefit of uh, AIs over tamoxifen. Um, the side effects uh, do also include hot flashes, depression. One of the different side effects from tamoxifen is it can lead to reduced bone density or osteoporosis. Um, joint pains or arthralgias are also fairly common um, and some changes in your lipid profile. So we do recommend that, they follow, that, uh, that we follow them up with their primary doctors to make sure that's being monitored uh, at least annually. It's also an oral agent taken by mouth for uh, five years in general, but again, there's possible benefit to longer therapy. So there's a couple of different studies looking at extended endocrine therapy. Um, we talked about ATLAS a little bit earlier. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on these, but they do have anywhere from two to almost 5% benefit, and you do need quite a, a few number, number needed to treat to get to that point. Um, but they all show hazard ratios that are pretty impressive, meaning the, the lower the hazard ratio, um, the better uh, intervention that is. So 0 0.58, 0 0.68, 0 0.62, 0 0.84, 0 0.65, and 0.66. So those are all fairly, uh, fairly impressive as far as uh, outcomes go. As far as uh, menopause, um, the NCCN defines menopause as patients that have had prior bilateral oophorectomy or removal of the ovaries. Uh, if you're above equal, uh, 60 or above. Um, if you're under 60, you have to be amenorrheic or not have any menstrual bleeding for at least 12 months without the use of tamoxifen or any ovarian suppression agent. And your FSH, was, which is a, a follicle stimulating hormone and estradiol have to be in the postmenopausal range. If you're on tamoxifen, then uh, FSH and estradiol need to be in the postmenopausal range. So uh, what exactly is ovarian suppression? It's also known as ovarian function suppression, or OFS, or OS. Basically, what you're doing is inducing menopause in patients that are not yet menopausal. And it's a uh, type of escalated endocrine therapy. We talked about extended endocrine therapy earlier. Now this is escalated endocrine therapy, like what do you do beyond just tamoxifen, or, um, and uh, this is one of the ways to do that. And uh, different ways you can do it is by adding uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormone analogs, uh, basically targeting the pituitary axis to send your system into menopause. Uh, or you can actually ablate the ovaries, either by removing them surgically or by radiation. Most patients opt for the GnRH analogs uh, rather than because those are reversible. It's basically an injection. It varies, but most of them are about once a month. Um, and um, uh, it's reversible. Basically, once you stop, uh, your ovarian function could potentially resume back to normal unless you really have gone into menopause at that point. Um, the side effects um, of endocrine therapy, um, while not as severe often as chemotherapy, it can be pretty severe because you're taking it for a longer period of time, right? So we do hear quite a few um, patients complain of many of these side effects, and often they can be quite debilitating. So uh, hot flashes we mentioned, there are some 
uh, medications that have been shown to have a benefit, such as venlafaxine or Effexor. Um, at San Antonio this past uh, winter, they did present a study with oxybutynin um, in patients that didn't have any contraindications to that and saw that it may uh, reduce some of the vasomotor symptoms. Um, with aromatase inhibitors, arthralgias are probably our most common complaint. Um, so we do use certain medications for that, like duloxetine. Um, there was a study about two years ago now that showed an actual ben uh, benefit to acupuncture to reduce some of these um, side effects of arthralgia. And then uh, exercise has been shown in some studies to have benefit. They are looking at it in, in a larger uh, study as well. Ovarian ablation also can have similar side effects, can be more severe, um, basically vaginal dryness, decreased libido, hot flashes, bone pain. Um, and you know, these are very significant in young patients, so we definitely don't wanna dismiss it because that's often a reason that patients don't want to continue therapy because you know, they're young, you wanna live your life, um, and this can be quite debilitating, so we need to find ways to kind of help, help patients with that. And then um, with ovarian suppression and aromatase inhibitors, we have to manage the side effect of bone loss. Sometimes we'll preventatively put people on medications to help reduce some of that, like bisphosphonates or uh, prolia, which is a rangal ligand. And then we generally also recommend use of calcium and vitamin D. Okay, so uh, one of the studies looking at uh, um, ovarian suppression was the, uh, well, it's really two trials, but they've kind of combined them into one basic analysis, uh, the text and soft. Um, and this was updated kind of middle of last year um, and published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, basically tailoring adjuvant endocrine therapy for premenopausal breast cancer. So uh, Basically, this is a soft. Um, the data total of about 5,700 patients. Um, about 3,000 were in the soft arm and were stratified. Um, basically, they got either tamoxifen alone or they got tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression. Uh, in this case, it was a GnRH analog called tryptorelin, or they got, got exemestane plus ovarian suppression, exemestane also known as aromacin. And then the, the uh, text arm, they got tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression or exemestane plus ovarian suppression. So uh, basically, they're, in this, the primary analysis uh, was uh, efficacy of ovarian suppression. Um, the primary analysis was looking at tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression versus tamoxifen alone. And the secondary analysis was exemestane plus ovarian suppression versus tamoxifen alone and that in both of these studies they were looking at is there a difference between tamoxifen versus exemestane when they're combined with ovarian suppression. So uh, the rationale for this was basically that they noticed that patients that went into um, chemo-induced amenorrhea uh, had better outcomes. So, you know, is there a benefit to actually just making you amenorrheic and inducing menopause? Uh, would you have better outcomes? So these are phase three studies, um, and um, as I said, tryptorelin was used as the GnRH analog. The women may also have received chemotherapy as part of the adjuvant treatment. Um, that was not uh, necessarily considered a specific part of the study. Um, the initial report uh, at 5.6 years didn't show a disease-free benefit. This was published in 2015 in New England Journal. Uh, um, of the tamoxifen plus uh, ovarian suppression versus tamoxifen alone. However, um, recently they did, in the newer update, um, they did find that adding ovarian function suppression to tamoxifen uh, significantly decreased the relative risk of disease-free survival events by 24% versus tamoxifen alone in the overall population after eight years median follow-up. So the, they found a 4.2% absolute benefit. And the uh, benefit was larger in women that remained premenopausal after receiving chemotherapy uh, before starting ovarian suppression, meaning that you get your chemo and your menses may come back sometimes during radiation or later, but um, some in patients that are, in general we'll tell patients that are 40 or above, you may just be um, permanently 
amenorrhea because of your chemotherapy, but in younger patients, they're more likely to resume ovarian function. So they did find a, a larger benefit in patients under 35 with an 8.6% absolute benefit at eight years. Um, so further reduction in recurrence was seen with the use of aromatase inhibitor exemestane plus ovarian function suppression. And over, overall survival benefit seen at eight years with the use of ovarian function suppression in women who remained premenopausal after receiving adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, so um, let me skip to the last part. The frequency of side effects, as you might expect, was higher than tamoxifen alone, uh, which is certainly significant uh, for young patients. Um, and then a median follow-up of nine years, the combined analysis confirmed statistically significant improvements in disease outcomes with exemestane versus tamoxifen in combination with the uh, ovarian suppression. Um, and then adjuvant exemestane plus ovarian suppression compared with tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression showed sustained absolute improvements in disease-free survival and freedom from distant recurrence of 4% and 2.1% at, at eight years. So, uh, I'm going to skip to um, the hazard uh, ratios here. This is basically a forest plot. They'll draw a line at 1.0. And an easy way to look at forest plot is anything to the left of the line shows a benefit of the intervention. Anything to the right of the line shows uh, ben not a benefit of the, uh, the intervention. So in this case, you're looking at tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression. <clears throat> Excuse me is better, or t is tamoxifen better? In most patients, they found that tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression tended towards some benefit with regards to disease-free survival, breast cancer-free survival, maybe not as much with distant recurrence-free interval. <coughs> and uh, in overall survival uh, was in patients with prior chemotherapy and overall, but not in patients that did not get chemotherapy. And this is the exemestane versus tamoxifen, and this is exemestane plus ovarian suppression versus <coughs> tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression. Excuse me. So how do you decide who gets um, combined therapy versus just uh, uh, tamoxifen or uh, basically, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, uh, but, you know, the, the studies may show a benefit, but at what cost? Basically, you have to, you know, take into account the patient and their tumor characteristics and potential side effects that may encounter. <coughs> so after the first analysis, they did develop a composite risk score and basically looked at traditional uh, clinical pathologic features, um, like their age, the tumor size, the grade, lymph node status, and the, the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor um, expression, as well as the KI-67. Um, in patients that have, have high recurrence risk, they did uh, see an absolute improvement of 10 to 15 percent with exemestane plus ovarian suppression versus tamoxifen plus ovarian suppression or tamoxifen alone. And then intermediate risk, um, at least 5 percent, and then low risk, minimal improvement. So eventually we'll probably end up stratifying these patients based on these characteristics. They are developing um, a, a web tool to help us decide who benefits from that. Um, there's still not a multi-gene assay available yet, but they do have tissue banked, um, so they may be um, developing that in the future as well. We're almost done. Um, so what are the, some considerations? Uh, it doesn't tell you whether to do chemo or not. It's unrelated to that. Very young women Interestingly, they didn't necessarily report worse quality of life, but they did stop treatment early more often. So we know they benefit the most. So we need to look at why, you know, why they're stopping treatment. What side effects do we need to help them with? Um, and what, how can we improve adherence if we really feel that that's going to benefit them? And because they did have the largest absolute benefit, um, HER2 positive patients also benefited from this. The next analysis is going to be planned for 2021. And there is a tissue banking translational component that may be um, added on. <clears throat> um, this one I'm going to skip. So I wanted to have enough time for questions. But 
uh, basically looking forward, what's next in uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer earlier stage. We know that cyclin-dependent kinase uh, 4, 6 inhibitors uh, that are used in the metastatic setting, could they have potential benefit in the adjuvant setting, meaning you haven't uh, recurred or been metastatic, but can we avoid developing metastatic disease by bringing them up in the earlier uh, disease course? Uh, so the PALACE study is looking at that. Um, for patients desiring pregnancy, there's a study um, that's, I, I believe it's still accruing, uh, called the POSITIVE study where you suspend um, adjuvant endocrine therapy after you've been on it for about 18 months, um, and you can hold it for about two years and then resume it after pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, so for young patients, that's obviously very important. Uh, neoadjuvant, different treatments in the preoperative setting, how can we get a good response so that your surgical outcomes are better and potentially your long-term outcomes are better, um, adding mTOR inhibitors, to tamoxifen, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, immunotherapy, could it have a benefit in ER positive disease? Uh, it recently just got approved um, for uh, triple negative disease, as many of you know. Um, so, you know, we may be seeing more information about that in, in hormone receptor positive disease as well. Um, and then maybe a different adjuvant chemotherapy option. Um, you know, a, a lot of our adjuvant chemotherapies right now are somewhat difficult to tolerate. And so is there a way that we can select patients for less intense treatment versus, um, you know, more intense treatments depending on different risk factors? So those are all being looked at. Um, vaccine studies, epigenetic analysis, so those are kind of all in the works. And of course, um, clinical trials, as you know, enrollment uh, is often um, not as um, high as we would like. A lot of studies close early, so to really get the best results, clinical trial enrollment is key. And that's all I have, because I wanted to save some time for questions. Um, do you want to come up here? Sorry, say that again. Extended. Good question. So uh, let me pull up that slide. <clears throat> so um, there is a test you may have heard of called BCI, Breast Cancer Index. Um, it's not FDA approved. Uh, basically, it looks at seven genes in your tumor. Now, this by, of course, uh, if you think about it, it's way after you've had your surgery. They're going back to your tumor from years ago to potentially do studies, so often tissue is not available. But if it is, you try to do um, uh, potentially this BCI test, which is based on seven genes, and it gives you a prognostic score and a predictive score. Um, so uh, it's not quite uh, used in young patients yet. But it's more geared towards postmenopausal patients. In younger patients, we tend to err on the side of longer therapy just because they have more aggressive disease in general. But in postmenopausal women, we are looking at who's more likely to relapse early and who's more likely to benefit from longer therapy. So that's, uh, is, it is now being covered by certain insurances, um, but I, I usually only recommend it in the postmenopausal setting. Uh, but yeah, they, are looking, they have looked at letrozole, extending it out uh, to 10 years. What they did find was um, there was a benefit with respect to breast cancer recurrence reduction. But as you would expect, there is a higher rate of osteoporosis, um, and so bone health has to be very, very well addressed uh, in that patient. So in general, in oncology, well, in medicine in general, absolute uh, 
we almost never find great absolute risk reductions. We may find relative risk reductions, you know. So, um, you know, there's not a specific number per se that, oh, this is a great absolute risk reduction, but anything that, you know, we say, see that is leading to a 4% in these large studies, um, we generally do take as positive just because there's there are rarely any benefits to, our, to many of the interventions that we do. But you're right, you do need to treat a lot, a lot, a lot of patients to, to get to that number. How many people are in a study that you get like 4.2% So the... The text and soft, I'll pull up the slide, they had uh, 5,738 patients randomized and 3,000 in, this, in the, um, in the uh, soft arm and about to, uh, almost 2,700 in the uh, text arm. So it requires a lot of patients. Uh, now, if you compare it to cardiology studies, they're lower, but car you know, our, our diseases tend to you know, be a very different and, you know, we have to be more cautious in who we're, we're putting in these studies. Right, most of the benefit is, except in the very young patients, the most of the benefit is in uh, disease-free uh, uh, recurrence. Yeah. Good question. Uh, we, get, we get that question from a lot of patients. We generally don't, A, because the risk is relatively small. Um, B, um, you know, in general, we, we have other symptoms that generally present, such as vaginal bleeding in patients that shouldn't be having um, bleeding. Now, it's a little bit harder uh, in younger patients that are still having menses, of course, but uterine cancer tends to develop later on after the five-year mark. Um, so we generally don't recommend it unless they're having unexplained postmenopausal bleeding, then that we would recommend an endometrial ultrasound followed by biopsy if they have a, uh, enough of a thickened stripe. Good question. There are some uh, uh, vaginal estrogens that are, you know, more, more localized, obviously. Sorry, I suddenly got real loud. Um, uh, that sometimes in, in occasional cases we may recommend, but you're, you're not reckless. This is a very common thing that comes up with young patients like you. So thank you for sharing uh, your symptoms. And I know many of your colleagues here would, would be facing similar things, so I appreciate that you brought it up. Unfortunately, this time we don't really have a way to, I mean, if, if I gave you estrogen, I'd be, you know, real, real <laughs> you know, I would be real reckless, you know, so, um, and, it, you know, we kind of tailor it to, you know, your, maybe if you had a lo relatively low risk tumor, maybe you could take a break on the AI briefly. I have given patients breaks on AIs, you know, for, you know, even a few months if necessary, because you, you've already had your, your uh, BSO, um, so, you know, you're relatively protected, if you think about it. Um, that being said, there's not 
there's not an absolute answer like as of yet, but they are they are looking into certain medications that may be may be uh, helpful in the future. And I should mention that I'm also bracket two five. Yeah. That's why I had it. Yeah. But it's basically you just can't have extra. There's nothing similar to that. Right. Not not as of yet, unfortunately, but um, they are we are looking into those. Um, alternative molecules. A lot of them are preclinical still, um, but you know, there is potentially some something coming down the pike maybe in the next five to 10 years. I know it's not helpful necessarily right now, but you know, sometimes it, a few months of a break on the AI can make a big difference as well. Um, but there's nothing that would reverse, uh, nobody would actively give you estrogen either through OCPs or intramuscular injections, sub-Q injections, because that, that would be considered uh, unacceptably high est systemic estrogen. Um, occasional topical estrogens, vaginal estrogens have been used for, for um, sexual function, that kind of stuff, so. Um, what's your opinion on ovarian suppression with gasarolin midway through chemotherapy? And is there any added um, benefit for recurrence in the in the future? Um, you mean right right out in the middle of a chemo? Yeah. yeah. Um, I believe it was um, a text that actually did that. They actually did start the ovarian suppression pretty early. Um, there was no obvious benefit except in those very young patients that I mentioned earlier, under 35. Um, but uh, we are doing it more often um, as a way to have continuous. Um, amenorrhea, basically ovarian suppression throughout, because you do regain it in younger patients after the chemotherapy ends. And we know that the younger patients tend to have a more uh, robust benefit. Um, I think one of the things I struggle with is so many choices that are afforded to us, which can be really empowering, but at the same time, it's like, do I do tamoxifen for five years? Do I do it for 10 years? Do I add an ovarian suppression and switch to an AI? As a medical professional, what insight can you share with us on how we make these decisions? Because so often, the answer we get from our oncologist is it's up to you, which I think for some of us can be really powerful and for some of us can be incredibly anxiety inducing. So like, if you were a patient, mm -hmm. how would you make these decisions? So um, good question. A, you have to see how, like a lot of patients will say, oh, I definitely don't want to take more than five years. I'm done because this is, I was counting down to five. I hate it, I have so many side effects, you know, I just wanna be monitored closely after I'm done. And you know, that's perfectly reasonable. If it is a higher risk tumor, I may advise them of the benefit of, um, you know, extending out the endocrine therapy, but there's no like right or wrong answer. It really is tailored to you. Um, as far as ovarian suppression, of course, the side effects are pretty, pretty significant. Um, so unless they have a very high risk, uh, sometimes I don't recommend it, um, but it really has to be tailored. And I agree, it can be very confusing for patients, especially if you're like, well, do what you want, you know, <laughs> that's not helpful to you. So you really have to look at, you know, your specific tumor, you know, what was your grade, stage, you know, what was your age of diagnosis. So, um, you know, if, if all those things are higher risk, then you may be convinced to try it for longer, as long as you're having ac acceptable <coughs> toxicity from the agents, not severe side effects. So it all kind of depends on the bone, like for example, AIs, if you're on a bone, um, if you're requiring bone strengthening agents and your osteoporosis is getting worse, I probably wouldn't continue that longer term. Um, tamoxifen, you know, same kind of thing. If you are um, smoking or if you have a, a blood clot history, then you kind of have to target it to, to, to the situation. Hi, um, I was wondering what you recommend as far as testing for bone health, um, particularly if you're on the uh, AI and uh, Lupron. Uh, good question. I usually get a baseline um, DEXA bone densitometry prior to starting, um, and then um, we usually will get it yearly on while on treatment. No. Risk until you're old, so we're not well, you're at risk if you're on ovarian suppression. You are making your ovaries old, right? So 
you're causing menopause. So um, if you are in ovarian suppression, you're uh, in menopause. So your risk factors will go up similar to a 55, 60 year old. So I always try to get a baseline. You're right, when you're young, the baseline study is gonna be normal. Um, and then there are some studies with prolia, uh, with uh, letrozole, that looked at declining bone density and uh, what uh, benefit does adding Ranca ligand, such as prolia, have on even just preventatively um, helping reduce the risk of osteoporotic fractures. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think you're too young is really not a good enough answer as far as... as <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You guys have a lot of good questions. Okay, I have a couple if you don't mind. Um, one is, what is the risk of ovarian cyst on tamoxifen? Because I feel like at least I've gotten cysts that I've had to have removed as everybody else. Uh, I've gotten cysts. Very common. Yeah. So. <laughs> and Very what common. can we do about it? Often, um, you know, sometimes I've had to switch patients to, um, o you know, ovarian suppression if the cysts are consistently problematic. Occasionally, you can hold it for a cycle or two and then see if they resolve. If they're symptomatic, I probably would switch to uh, an alternative method of uh, endocrine therapy. Um, second question is, what about those of us who are partially hormone positive, like progesterone 30%, estrogen 60%, where do we fall? So we know that um, the higher the ERPR, the better you respond to endocrine therapy, the more likely you are to have uh, lower grade disease, um, lower KI-67s. Um, one of the risk factors for more aggressive disease is high ER, low PR, like a discordant uh, ERPR. Um, the thought is that maybe progesterone is somewhat uh, limiting the um, aggressiveness of the estrogen receptor. Um, so, um, you know, you, we, we would still use endocrine therapy regardless, of course, but it is, it's kind of shades of, of um, as far as a prognosis, it'll be con like a continuous. So the higher your estrogen receptor percentage, the, the better the response to endocrine therapy. Gotcha. And I guess my last hopefully quick question um, is, every study that I've seen of tamoxifen shows that in premenopausal women that it's not pro bone, it's only in postmenopausal women. Are there newer studies that came out that I haven't seen? Well, in younger patients, you're not really looking for um, underlying osteoporosis. Um, so those studies probably haven't looked at, you know, like she said, she was too young to get a bone density test done. You know, in your 30s, you wouldn't be getting bone density tests. So really, we're only checking in postmenopausal women. And you still have estrogen around if you're not on ovarian suppression. So that is continuing to strengthen your bones. Um, so it's continuing to be bone protective. Uh, adding it in postmenopausal women, though, is definitely bone protective because they didn't have any uh, modulation of that receptor. And now they do. So they're going from nothing to, to something. Okay. That totally makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Hi, um, my question is in terms of discussing or navigating these conversations with our medical oncologists. Um, I was diagnosed at 29, so, and I've gone through a myriad of, of just tamoxifen and then the um, ovarian suppression. How do we, um, how should we approach those conversations with our medical oncologists when they're, we're talking about maybe four and 5% benefit and I, I literally, I call uh, Fexor side effects or I have a, I every single side effect you can imagine um, I've been battling with for the past three years. So um, how, how do we navigate those kinds of questions uh, with our medical professionals? So, um, you know, good question and thanks for sharing um, your symptoms, of course. Um, you know, you have to find somebody that you're on a good, you have a good rapport with, obviously. Um, a lot of patients will come see us as a second opinion because you know, they were told what to do with, without really going over options or side effects, things like that. So it really needs to be more than a 20 minute visit. It's, it, it's a very complicated discussion. And sometimes you won't have it all in one visit and you may need multiple visits. Um, and how does it apply to me? Like tech stuff, you're 29, we know that you're highly um, likely to benefit from it, patients under 35. 
Um, so they, they really will push for it to, for, you know, to have you on as much as possible. Um, that being said, those patients your age are more likely to not be compliant with treatment because probably because of the side effects and you're young and healthy otherwise you want to live your life you don't want these side effects so is there a middle ground is there something that uh, a research study that you can be potentially enrolled in um, you know like that that other um, uh, lady was asking is there something coming in the future so you know I usually will look into possible clinical trials that may address some of the side effects. You know, clinical trials are not just for chemo or actual medical interventions for the breast cancer per se. There's a lot of clinical trials for supportive care, um, psychosocial aspects of breast cancer therapy, um, sexual side effects of breast cancer therapy. I think you guys had a, a lecture about some of that or, or about to have a lecture about that as well. Um, so, you know, it's a very... Um, nuanced discussion, and I, I'll be happy to talk to you more about it, but it's not one right or wrong answer. You know, it has to be, each symptom needs to be addressed differently, probably. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. Um, on one of your slides, you had mentioned, uh, it said that Arimidex for postmenopausal women, that you have to check lipid levels for the, it said, Dyslipidemia. Yes. So if you end up, because I looked it up and it's, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. So if you do end up finding out through blood work that you have high levels of cholesterol, is that something that can be controlled by diet or would you have to be prescribed another medication for that? Um, it depends on the degree of, um, you know, how high your levels are. You know, usually we would recommend diet modification first and see if it improves. And, you know, diet and exercise is a whole other aspect of survivorship that we didn't really talk about today, but is very, very important in breast cancer. Um, and, um, you know, reducing fat, alcohol, all those things can improve your lipid profile. Um, but, um, yeah, sometimes we do need to start medications, a statin or whatever, for uh, if the diet is, is not controlling it enough. Good question. Thank you guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Malik, for your time. Yeah, thank you.